Today we're going to start a new series entitled The Return, and we're going to look at the return of Christ. And we're going to go to a passage of Scripture. We're not going to go to Revelation, where John would write about it. We're actually going to look at what Peter, I mean, what Paul said to the early church, he was talking to them because the early church had questions about the return of Christ. The early church had questions about, hey, we heard that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe in Jesus Christ. When is it going to happen? What do we look for? And so over the next three weeks, we're going to focus in on, on what Paul is saying to the early church, and guess what? It's for us today. It's for a focal point of us today. And so we're going to talk about what it says in Scripture about the, 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 the return of Christ or the, the second return here. And uh, you may be wondering, I don't know, if you, were, if you had that thought of like, hey, over the last two plus years, I mean, a lot of crazy things have happened in the world. And maybe in that time you've thought, I wonder if, like, this is a sign that Jesus is going to come a little sooner. You know, maybe you thought, maybe even I heard there was already a book that said last year that Jesus was going to come last year, right? And uh, guess what? He hasn't come yet, right? He hasn't returned yet. And we don't know what day or hour or time, but Paul gives us some indicators of how to be prepared, how to be ready. And we're going to look at those today in the New Testament in 1 Thessalonians chapter chapter 5. So I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to look at uh, this church planner. Paul was a, he was a religious man. He was an elite person that had all the education, all the knowledge that you needed to have. He got radically saved, got touched by God. Right? You know, the, maybe you remember the story, he's riding on a horse and literally God knocks him off his horse, he's blind, and God takes him through a journey of just uh, really humbling himself and then encountering the Lord in just this powerful way. Well, this this man, Paul, that we're talking about goes on to be a church planner in uh, the city, a Greek city of Thessalonica. So this is an area when Paul, when you read the New Testament, a lot of the letters are written to a church in an area. So maybe they would call, you know, they, if he was writing a church to Ashland City, it would, you know, he would name it something like that, and it would be the Book of Ashland City or something like that. But he was writing letters, and in this case, he's writing to this church, and he writes two letters. And the first one in First Thessalonians, we're going to start out by looking at the beginning part in chapter 5. In chapter 5, he begins this... this uh, he begins to talk to the early believers, the, the, the early church, those that are asking the, these questions. And he says, now concerning how and when all this will happen, concerning when things in the world will take place, when Jesus will return, he says, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you. We don't really need to tell you. You should already know we've talked to you about this. But he says, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will be, what? Unexpected. It'll happen just like that. You, you can't plan for it. You, you won't be ready for it. And he's reminding the early church, he's telling them again, hey, listen, you're asking these questions. When is he going to come back? You know, because here's the thing is, in every time period, there's, there's something that happens in the world and those that believe in Jesus ask the question, hey, are the times getting that bad that Jesus could return any minute? Early church is asking the same thing. And Paul reminds him, listen, when Jesus returns, it'll happen unexpectedly. Like a thief in the night, when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure. Now, isn't it interesting that when we typically think about when, you know, usually when things are going crazy is when we think, is Jesus about to come back, right? I mean, we, during 9-11, right, when the Twin Towers were hit, churches were packed full of people. And you would think, wow, there's an urgency to the hour. But the Word of God, what Paul is saying is, he says, when you least expect it, when everything has actually come to a calm, 
when everything has slowed down, when things have come to a place that, that, that globally things seem to be solved, right? The problems of the world seem to be solved. In those moments, he says, then disasters will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman in labor, in those labor pains, as they begin to begin, there will be no escape from it. So just like, he's saying, just like those labor pains can come on, just like those things can begin to occur, all of a sudden, there's going to be an unexpected pain, an unexpected movement, an unexpected, here it comes. Now, now Jessica, you just had your little beautiful little girl there, and when it was time, the pain came unexpectedly, right? Right? And it was painful, right? Uh, ladies, if you've been through that, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But he's, he's relating it to something that everyone in any era of life can relate to. But then he says in verse 4, he says, But you aren't in, in the dark about these things, there, brothers and sisters, right? You're followers of Jesus Christ. And you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes. You won't, you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are the children of the light and of the day. You are the children of light. You are God's children. And you don't belong to the darkness into the light, uh, into, the, into the night. So be on guard. It says not, don't be asleep. Don't be asleep like others. Stay alert. Be sober or, or clear-headed. In verse 7 it says, Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, sober, protected by the armor of faith and love or breastplate and wearing the helmet with confidence of our salvation. And then in verse 9, for God chose to save us through our Lord, and, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. In verse 10, Christ died for us so that whether we were dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So a lot of times when we talk about uh, when, you, when you do anything related to end times, usually there's a lot of interest in this. And you have one, or, one of two types of people. You either have the one that is absolutely consumed with end time predictions and prophecies. And they're, they're so focused. They wanna, they've got the charts out and they, they're just absolutely consumed with everything related. They want to know when they're watching and monitoring the news, wondering, you know, when could this be the moment? So some are just really, really engaged in it. And then there's another group that really just feels like, does it even matter? Maybe you're one of those two today. Maybe you say, you know what, I just want to know everything about the return of Christ. Or maybe you're one that says, I really just don't care. Does it really matter? You know, what is this whole thing about? And here's what we find. is Somewhere in the middle, we find the teaching of Paul to this to this group of believers, and he's giving them something to hold on to, something to, to be challenged by. And here's the main idea of this message today. Readiness for the return of Christ is less about understanding global events. It's less about that and the happenings, and more about living spiritually alive and awake. Let me say that to you again. The readiness, the you being ready for the return of Christ is not you monitoring global events. Right? I don't know about you, but there's sometimes I kind of get hooked on the news and I want to know what's happening around the world. Other times I just don't want to know anything, right? Maybe you're one that watches the news all the time. Maybe you never watch the news. But let me tell you, you being ready is absolutely critical, but your readiness is less about monitoring what's happening in the world and instead about being ready, being spiritually alive and awake. That's what we're called to be, right? To be spiritually alive and awake. And the whole core of Christianity is based on one central theme, one central focus. And that is that Jesus Christ, he died. But he, 
His promise was not that he would just die, but that he would, he went, right? He, he rose again, but the promise was that he's going to return. So the whole central theme is that Jesus Christ died, did what no one else did. Everyone dies, but then he rose again, and then he promises to return one day for us. And so we see here that Paul gives these three metaphors that we just read. And we're going to kind of go back through them just for a moment. And if you got some notes, there's a little place for you to write. Because honestly, I feel many times that things happen in life and I, and I feel like, are we ready? Jesus, if you came tomorrow, would we be ready? And, and I've thought many times, how do you stay ready 24-7? If you grew up in church in the 80s, I've mentioned this before, if you grew up in church in the 80s, there was a famous book, I think it was like 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Return in 1988. Did anyone ever buy that book, just out of curiosity? Okay, nobody willing to admit that, right? Well, it was great. Like, it was, so, it was such a, it was a bestseller. Everyone's buying the 88 reasons why Jesus, and guess what? Jesus didn't come back, right? You know how I know? Do you, do you ever look to the most spiritual person you know? Like, you ever have one of those moments? Did you ever have one of those moments growing up? Where you like, you, you went into your house and your mom wasn't there and there was like water boiling or something like that and you're just thinking, the rapture has occurred, right? And then you found that person, you found your mother, you found that the most spiritual person you know and they had not gone yet and you, whew, he hasn't come yet. Hopefully, if you haven't gone, you're like, he hasn't come yet, okay? Hopefully you're it, right? Hopefully you're the one, right? Well, here, here's the wonderful thing is that Paul gives us these metaphors and, and I want us to walk through them just, just again. And the first one is that it's going to be like a thief in the middle of the night who breaks into your house and robs you. So you're not going to know when it's going to happen. You're not going to be able to really be prepared because if I said, hey, listen, at one o'clock tomorrow morning, someone's going to break into your house and going to steal everything that you have, what would you do? You would stay up till one o'clock in the morning, right? And have whatever you need to protect yourself, right? My wife would have some knife in her hand. I know she would, right? She, she, she motioned like, what, were, what was that motion? You, you're going to have a shotgun. I could tell you a story about this, but we're not going to go there. Refocus, refocus. She tried holding a shotgun, and it was like as big as her, and she's like this, and I'm like, this is not good. We need, we need another. Anyway, if I were to tell you that tonight was the night, you would what? You would be ready. You would be fortified. You'd make sure every lock in the world was on the house. You'd make sure your possessions were in the right place. You would make sure your kids slept in your room, right? You would do everything you could. And here Paul says this again. He says, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. A thief doesn't announce himself. A thief doesn't say, hey, by the way, ring the doorbell. Hey, just want to let you know I'm going to rob you. You know, there, there's no advance warning. It happens quickly. And Paul uses this metaphor that Jesus himself talked about with his disciples. And there was this moment that Jesus is talking, them, talking with them and giving them a very similar metaphor in James 24. I'm sorry, in Matthew 24. Uh, Jesus is giving this metaphor to his disciples in Matthew 24, verse 42. And it says, it says, so you too must keep watch. He's telling the disciples He's with them. He's encouraging them. He says, you've got to keep watch. He says, for you don't know what day the Lord will come. Understand this. If a, home, if a homeowner kept exactly, knew exactly when a burglar was going to come in, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready at all times, be ready at all times, for the Son of Man will come when you least expect it. Paul is referencing what Jesus was telling his disciples. Listen, you're not going to know. And, and here's the thing is, it's been 2,000 years, right? And Jesus told the disciples 2,000 years ago, live ready. It's been 2,000 years. You imagine living your whole life and then dying and say, he didn't come back, but I was living ready. 
Let me tell you, the reason we are to live ready, and, and, and I honestly believe that, here, here's the thing is that I, I honestly believe that we are in a season, like if there was ever a season in life that we were in the beginning of the end, this is it. Does that mean Jesus is going to come back next year? He may not come back for 50 years, 100 years, but there's no doubt in my mind that things are happening in the world around us that we can't deny and that we would say, Jesus, we need to live ready. So that what Jesus is challenging his disciples with and encouraging them to do is he's saying, live like no one else is living, right? Be ready, be focused, because it's absolutely crucial that you live that way because at any moment... I can, I can come back and return. And then it even continues. It says, even in the days of Noah, right? Just like in the days of Noah. The craziness in the days of Noah. Now remember Noah. Do you remember the story of Noah? Right? He's building an ark in a place where there's no water. He's literally building a boat, right? The, I mean, he's, he might as well be like in, in the desert, Right? He might as well just be in a place that has, I mean, here he is building a boat, and people are like, you're crazy. And he's building a boat, he's building a boat. And then one day, it happens, when they least expected it. It happens, and everyone in the entire world at that moment said, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But Noah lived ready, right? Now, he was building something, and then the, the day the Lord said, okay, it's time, yeah, I mean, he said, hey, it's, it's time. We, we got we to gotta do this. It's time. Here's the thing is, we won't know the, the moment or the hour, but we have this indicator in what Paul is saying. He said, there's no way to be ready except to live constantly ready. And here's the thing is, you may think, because here's the thing is, we all get kind of excited. Like maybe today we're like, man, I'm ready. I'm ready. And then we have a Monday. And we're like, I want to kill somebody. I'm not ready. Right? I mean, I just, I'm not ready, right? Here's the thing is, it, it, uh, Paul is here. He's encouraging us to say, hey, listen, he is coming. He is coming. And if he's coming at any moment, then our posture needs to change. That means what we do, what we think on, the, the way we just do life needs to shift and change. But then Paul also gives this other analogy, and he talks about it's like a woman in labor. And he gives this analogy that everyone understands. He says like a, like a woman in labor. And, and he says here, he's in this letter, he says, when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure. Now, how many remember we've had three children the last two I remember a little bit clearer than the first one, but I remember there being a moment, especially at like the nine month mark. So does anyone remember being with, your, being with your wife or being with someone when they're getting ready to have a baby? Does anyone remember that moment? Okay, there's a few people. All right, there's more people over here. This is like the dad section over here. <laughs> but I remember there was like, as Leslie went through the process, you know, went through month one, month two, month three, month four, like she's growing. There's a, you know, a beach ball, you know, involved here, right? She's growing. And then all of a sudden, like everything was like manageable. And when we got to that last month, I mean, she was looking at me with like crazy eyes. Like she was looking at me like, this baby better come right now, right? I mean, like, it was, it was intense. Like, I just remember looking at her and thinking, okay, Lord, let this baby hurry up and come. And then all of a sudden, like, the intensity began to happen. All of a sudden, she would be there, and she'd be fine, and then all of a sudden, she would, ooh, right? And there would just be this, 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 what they would call Braxton Hicks. And I remember with our last one, at least I think it was the last one. I don't remember. They all kind of blur together. I should have her come up and do a testimony of this. Yeah. But I remember we went to the hospital. I don't remember if it was Jeremiah or Gianna, either one of them. But I remember we went to the hospital because the pain was intense. And they said, well, you're having contractions, but you're not dilated. But the contractions were intense. Like, she is a very strong woman, right? She can take anything. And she was just like, this is, this is a lot. 
And I remember as all that is taking place, just the pain that would come and then there would just be an ease. And then the pain would come. And all right, so you, you're familiar if you've seen it happen. If you're, but that was what Paul was talking about. He said there are labor pains that are going to come. There's going to be a moment of calm and peace, just like between those contractions, right? Just between like the, okay, everything's good right now. And all of a sudden, ah, right, the pain is going to come. And, and here Paul is telling him, he says, listen, everything is going to be peaceful. And then disaster. Disaster will fall on them. When you think that it's all good, we've made it through the worst, we've made it through the hump, the things in our life have already happened, things in this world are, 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 are going crazy, and now they have calmed down. Let me tell you, when they calm down, that's when he said, that's when I'm going to come. And usually we're thinking the opposite way. We look at the world and we watch the world ramp up to something that may happen and we watch things begin to take place and we just think, he's going to come now. But Paul reminds us that that is not when it's going to happen. And Paul is now again borrowing from what Jesus said in one of his teachings and And in Matthew 24, verse 4 and 8, it says, Jesus told them, he says, don't let anyone mislead you. Don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And in verse 6 it says, And you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But then he says something crucial. He says, don't panic. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. So why do we talk about these things? Because we could look at uh, our current world and we could say, hey, things are ramping up. There's a possibility of things happening. You could fill in the blank of what you think that may be. And you may think, well, I'm going to get ready. And Jesus' words too is don't panic in this moment, but understand it's not coming yet. It will come quickly, but it's not coming yet, but you need to live ready. The reason we need to live ready is because there's something absolutely critical for us to do in these moments. Because when he comes, it'll be too late. When Jesus returns, it'll happen in a blink of an eye, quicker than we all can even fathom or, or understand. When he comes, we, we may say, oh man, I wish I would have told this person about Jesus. I, would, I wish I would have shared with my relationship with more people. I wish I would have been more drawn to, to, to go in to, to tell people about, about the grace and about the love of Jesus. I wish I would have. And, and when he comes, it's over. It's done. That's it. So in these moments, as things begin to ramp up, this is our moment to say, listen, we need to focus on what needs to be done. We need to live ready. And we also need to live set apart in these moments. He continues and he says in verse, this is in Matthew 24. It says in verse seven, nations will go to war against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes. You could probably throw pandemics in there. In many parts of the world, but in verse 8 says, but all this is only the first of the birth pains to come. This is just the beginning. This is the Braxton Hicks. This is just the the leading up to. These things are just the, the moments. And so here, I think we could probably say, hey, I think we're maybe having some of these moments. Who knows how long they'll take? Who knows how long things will, will play out? But I think we can say, hey, listen, there are things that are happening in this world that make you wonder, Jesus, are you going to come? You can almost say that we're living in the final trimester of, of the human race, of, of human history. You can almost say that, that we're getting closer to these moments. And if those are the cases, then we should live differently. Paul gives one other, uh, one other analogy here, and he says, uh, it'll be like the middle of the night. Now, what has to happen in the middle of the night? It's got to be dark, right? It's got to be really dark. For the middle of the night is what? Uh, it's literally the, the, the moment. It's typically the darkest hour. It's literally the, the moment that's absent of the most light because usually as the sun goes down, you have you know, those moments leading up to, like I love, I love the summertime 
because I, my clock in my, you know, I get all mixed up and I'm like, what time is it? And it's like, it's 8.30. And it's like, it's not like six, you know what I mean? Do you ever, did anybody get mixed up in the summer? You, it, like the sun is out, you know, days are longer, it's great. And then at five in the morning, you know, the sun's back up and I'm just like, come on, you know. Jesus, don't let the sun come up till like seven, you know what I mean? I'm just kidding. So, but here's the thing is that in the middle of the night, this is when it's the darkest. And let me just tell you, we are living in a dark age. We are living in a moment that's dark, that is void of light, that, that there are those that are drawn even more so to the darkness. And, and, and it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, it says, but you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, right? You won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief, for you are the children of light. You're the children of the day. We belong, you don't belong to the darkness or the night. So he gives this, this challenge and he says, listen, times are going to get, they're going to get darker. So when I watch the news and I see things happen and you and I see the world and you're just thinking, what we believe is, is like the world is pulling further and further away from the moral standard of what, what a Christian believer, one that's following Jesus, it w- would believe in, right? And we think, wow, this world is getting darker and darker. Let me tell you, the world will get darker. And guess what? But it needs children of the light in the darkness. It needs the children of the light, the ones that have hope, the ones that have... The, 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 Jesus said, listen, the, your mission is to draw men to you by me inside of you. And if I'm inside of you, then you'll draw men to you and you can point them to me, right? We should be a reflection of him. We should literally, listen, we're not the saving hope he is, but he should be alive in us to the place where we say, listen, let me point you in the right direction. Let me tell you about what he's done in my life. This is a desperate hour. And here's the thing is that I found is that when it gets darkest, people get desperate. And when people are desperate, they're willing to do things they've never done before. This is a critical hour for those that believe in Jesus Christ. This is a critical hour. This isn't one to say, well, you know, the world's getting worse. Wars are happening. Let's bunker down. Let, let's hunker down. Let's, let's, let's create, let's fortify. Our, this is the moment for us to, to run into battle. I love that movie. What is that movie? Was it, uh, I can't remember the name of the movie. It was a military movie. And the guy was saying, he, he was a believer, right? He was a, and he said, I'm going to go back and get just one more. Remember that movie? Who knows the name of them? Hacksaw Ridge. I'm not saying you watch the movie. I'm just saying that was part of it, okay? But the mission of what he was doing is he's saying, if I can just go get one more. If I can just go get one more. Let me tell you, the goal of, of what we do should be, Lord, let me have another moment with someone. Let me not miss the moments to share about what you've done in my life. Because if he has truly transformed your life, you should be telling people about that. It should be evident in your life. Now I want to give you just three application or takeaway points for you that, that are challenges for all of us. And the first one is, we see in verse, in verse 6, he says, so be on guard. Don't be asleep, right? Don't be asleep like others. Be on guard. Be ready. Stay alert. Stay clear-headed. The night is the time when people sleep and drunkards get drunker. The, the night is things, but be ready. And the first challenge is for us is to stay sober. I'm not talking about alcohol, although it's not bad. <laughs> Probably wouldn't be a bad idea either. Like, stay sober there too. But to stay alert. Stay focused. Understand the moment that you're living. Do you realize, let me just help you understand something. If you feel like, I, I, I don't have a purpose, I'm just going through life, I don't, you know, I see other people with great purpose in their life and I see others doing great things, let me just tell you, you have been chosen for the fourth quarter and you're being put into the game in the last two minutes of the game, the most crucial part of history. God chose you for this moment, for this hour. You may not see your value, but he knows your value. In fact, the word of God says he formed you in your mother's womb. He is readying you. He knows what he has deposited inside of you. So in this moment, it is crucial for us to stay sober. It's crucial for us to stay ready, for us to live alert, for us to say, God, how do you want to use me in this hour? So one day the heavens will open and he'll return. 
And let me tell you, that's going to be an amazing day. You know, the early church would greet one another, and they would say, Maranatha. Even, Lord, come quickly. Even so, Lord, come quickly. They would greet each other, and they would, they would see each other, and they would say, Maranatha, come, Lord. I don't know, if you ever have a day like that? I have some days like that. I tell Leslie them, it's not a good thing to do. I tell her, and I'm like, I'm ready to go. And she's like, you're not going anywhere. I was like, Jesus, you can come right now. I'm ready to go, right? Because you ain't going nowhere. You're staying with me till we raise all these kids and have grandchildren. That's how this is playing out. But there are some days I'm ready. I'm just like, Jesus, you can take me right now. I'm good to go. But think about the era and the, the, the time period you're living in. You're living in a time period with the most amount of people ever on the planet Earth. Seven billion people on planet Earth. Do you ever think about when you go to heaven one day? Do you ever like kind of think, well, if I could talk to anyone? Do you ever think about that? Like if I could just talk to someone when I go to heaven? Like, you know, there's Jesus. But I mean like anyone in the Bible or anyone through history that was a believer, like, who do you think of when you think of who you would talk to? Like, you, know, you make an appointment, like, hey, you know, can I catch, you know, David, you know, can I get coffee with you? You know, tell me about how you killed the Goliath, you know, or, or whatever, you know, Moses, you know, you're standing. What, just throw out a few names. Who, who would you like to have coffee with in heaven and just, just kind of pick their brain about some things? Anyone? Elijah? S- Joseph? Esther? Paul? Okay. So you you imagine sitting down with these heroes of the faith, these individuals, and and also you're sitting there, and you're just like, Paul, tell us about that moment. Like, how many times did you almost get killed? And he's going through them. He's like, well, there was this time. And and you're just like, man, wow. And tell me about how close it, and tell me, like, can you just imagine him just talking you through the moments that were just critical But I believe those moments, I mean, those are going to be some amazing conversations. But I also believe that anyone we could have coffee with, because you do know coffee coffee will be in heaven. Did you know that? It will be. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if creamer will, but coffee will definitely be there. Might be an espresso bar. I don't know. Anyway, the coffee's there, okay? Coffee's there, right? But think about what they might turn to you and say. Think about this. What would they turn to you and say? You're asking the heroes of the faith, tell me about the journey. Tell me the stories. Can you imagine them turning to you and say, tell me about living in the last days. Tell me what you were doing. Tell me those moments. Tell me those critical moments. I mean, you were, you were in that moment. God had created you. Tell me what was going on in your life. And you know what you're not going to say? I binge watch Netflix for like, right? I mean, I looked through every YouTube video about cats there were, right? I hit the Facebook reel thing for like two hours and watch absolutely pointless things happen, occasionally learning how to make food faster for my family, right? Or, or whatever it is, right? Is that what you're going to tell No, you're not going to tell them that. I pray and hope that if those conversations were to happen, that you'd say, let me tell you how I live sober. Let me tell you how I lived ready. Let me tell you how I live full of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you how awesome it was in that moment. Let me tell you that. Let me tell you, our focus in this hour should be, and this is what I, I pray that Every single day, listen, I realize every single day we wake up and we don't just feel like, you know, we got it and, and we sometimes wake up and we just feel like already defeated. I understand that, but understand the hour you're in. Understand the place you're in. Understand what you've been called to. Understand that you are in a place. And let me tell you, when we stand before the Lord and when we're, we're with the other great men and women of the word of God uh, and, and we're there, listen, we should say, listen, I want to live on fire for God with purpose, with the purpose of God. I want to preach the gospel in this hour. I want to be filled with the spirit of God that he leads me, he anoints me, he opens doors for me, that I see those that don't know him come back to him, that all of a sudden that in these moments I see signs and wonders begin to occur, that it is the most amazing season of my life. 
That should be our response and our hope and our drive. That we should do everything we possibly can. And if you don't think that's it, if you think, you know what, I just kind of want to just make it through and just do my thing, let me tell you, you're missing out on the purpose of God. Because you can get a lot of things in life, but if you're missing the purpose of God, you're missing it. Because he has formed and created you to do something critical in this hour. And I pray that we don't just look back and we just say, I survived it. I made it through. But we say, you know what, I look for opportunities to live like no one else. I look for opportunities. It wasn't always the easiest way. I look for opportunities. I quit whining and complaining about the little things. Can I say that to you? I quit whining. I, I was focused. I was engaged. I quit letting the little foxes in my life destroy the things of my life. And I was focused on what God wanted to do in my life in that hour. Let me give you the second one. And that is that we need to live ready. So not only do we need to live sober, that means that we're alert, we're, we're, but then live ready. Like this is it. We're ready. Paul uses, uses this in his letter in the similar language that we find in Ephesians chapter 6 talking about the armor of God. Paul uses this and he, and he, he says that we don't, we don't battle or fight against flesh and blood. Listen, if you get worked up about one individual or about how you're going to fix things by go, going after an individual, you've missed what this life is about. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The, 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 war, the war that we rage is, is a little bit different. It's in an unseen world. It's in a place, and Paul challenges us. He says, put on the armor. Get ready. Get ready. Put on what you need to put on because this is a critical hour. You can't be ready without the armor. You say, well, I wake up and I feel good and I get your cup. You, you. Listen, sometimes we think the coffee is the armor of God because it gives us confidence and boldness and it helps us wake up. Let me just tell you, the word of God is a thing that guards our mind. The word of God is a thing that renews our mind. The word of God is the, the, the two-edged sword. It's the, the, the thing that we battle with, right? We wage war with. The armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, right? The belts of truth. These are very intentional things that if you're going to be ready, you've got to live ready, and you've got to come suited up ready. Because nobody steps on the battlefield in any area in this world without having the right equipment. It would be foolish for us to just walk out there into any type of real battle with no armor and no weapons. And Paul is reminding us, and he's, he's saying again what, what we see here in Ephesians 6, verse 13. He says, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be ready to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after you battle, stand firm. Stand your ground, put on the belt of truth uh, and uh, the, the body of armor of God's righteousness for the shoes put on peace. Let me tell you, you still need peace when you're going to war. You still need to have peace. It says put on the very peace of God that comes from the good news so that you'll be able to fully be prepared. In addition to all these things, hold up the shield of faith that stopped the very fire, fiery arrows of the enemy. Put on salvation as a helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's crucial in this moment that we're ready to do battle. So we're sober and we're ready. We're ready to engage. Now you may say, this is a message that has been preached for 2,000 years. And I would say, you're absolutely right. This message has not changed. And you say, but Jesus hasn't returned and it's been 2,000 years. And yet, he still called us to be ready. Because here's the thing is, is that throughout life, right, things happen, and the very mission that we're on is to tell people about Jesus, is about to share the hope of who he is. And you can't step out your front door, or get out of your bed without being spiritually ready. But in this hour, more than ever before, let me challenge you, if we're in the final trimester of of the human race, of human history, it's crucial that we live ready. 
It's crucial that we live ready in this moment. Let me give you this final one. And that is that we need to speak life. You think, whoa, what in the world does that have to do with being ready? Let me tell you, speak life. Speak life. Because you know what happens is that a lot of times we're ready. And us being ready, sometimes when you're ready and focused, you're like in the zone, but you're not speaking life. You're ready, but everyone around you seems to be a casualty of your readiness. Like, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready to take my And all you're doing is just hurting those around you. Let me tell you, be sober, be ready, and then speak life. Be alert, be focused, put on the armor. And Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians, he says, he says, encourage or help each other and build each other up as you're already doing. And any type of warfare, any type of uh, battle that's being raged, you are not called to be a lone soldier on the battlefield. And what you need is a lot of good people around you that are ready to do battle with you. Because, and that means that you've got to speak life. Let me tell you, if you're, if you're, if you're fighting together, you look at a person on your right and left, you say, let's do this. You ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Are, do you got your gear ready? Yeah, I got my gear. Do you have, oh, you're missing this? Let me help you with that. Because we got to go through this together. We need each other. Man, you, you're ready. You look good. You got all your stuff ready. You feel confident. You feel ready. I'm ready. Let me tell you, in this hour, it's the exact same thing. So not only do we need to be sober and alert and ready, but we want to speak life. Let me tell you, the Lord is not asking you to be ready in this end time as a solo act of what you're going to do. But he is calling you to partner with those around you to be ready together. As one body, he's calling us to be ready. And as we speak to each other, encouraging one another, helping each other, building each other up, do you know what that does? Let me tell you, sometimes on, on a Sunday morning, someone will walk in here, and what they really need is some encouragement. They need to know that the week that they just had, that they felt like they blew it, they didn't blow it. There's hope. Jesus wants to minister to you today. And Jesus ministers to us, not only just through the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts, but he uses each of us to then minister to one to another. Let me tell you, some of the greatest things you can do is be an encouragement to one another. And not just like, good job, but like, hey, we're in this together. Let's stay focused. Let's stay sober. Let's stay on task. Let's understand the mission, the assignment of this moment, of this hour. Because if we are in that final trimester, if we're in that last month, we're, in the, we're hitting the ninth month, right? It's going to get rocky. There's things that are going to happen. And you know what we want to do to one another is when things get a little crazy. Listen, if the world goes nuts tomorrow... The best thing that we can do is look at one another and say, we're in this, right? We're in this. What did the word of God tell us? It's going to come, it's going to come quick. And it's not going to come when we're expecting it. It's going to come when it calms down. So look, it's going crazy right now. Let's be vigilant. People are, are desperate. They're looking for answers. Let's bring them some answers. Let's bring some light into the darkness. Let's be on task. Let's understand the assignment of this hour. Because when he comes, not only do we want to be ready, let me tell you, I think the greatest regret we're going to have when Jesus comes is who we did not tell about him. Because right now, a lot of times we're focused on us. Man, if I can just get to heaven. Man, if I can just, and we're focused on us. But I think the greatest regret we're going to have is who we didn't tell. I don't know if you've ever had a regret in your life, but when regret comes, you think, man, there's nothing else I can do. That'll be a final hour. Can I say live sober in this hour? Live sober and alive and awake and ready. And when, as it gets darker, say, Lord, use me. I'm not a child of the darkness. I don't want to be drawn to the things of the darkness, Lord. You've called me to light and to be hope. Lord, I want to be that in this hour. I want to ask our team to come. And I want to ask you as they're coming, I want you to just take a moment. And I want you to begin to think for just a moment. Lord, am I, am I living sober? Am I living ready? 
Am I living with the right mindset? Or, or am I just living for tomorrow? Am I just living for what happens uh, throughout this week? Because here's the thing, is that sometimes life is consuming. Does anyone, would anyone admit life can be consuming? Some days, listen, turn, one day, feel, sometimes a week goes by and it feels like it's been a long day. And sometimes crisis happen in our life and we just think, I don't know what to do. And we get focused on the crisis. And this is why we need each other. To remind one another, he's coming. Let's keep our focus where it needs to be. Let's live sober. Let's, you, know, you know what living sober means? We remove the things in our life, the excess in our life. We remove the things that are going to take our focus off. We, we remove any hindrances. We're ready. We wake up in the morning and we say, Lord, I put on the whole armor of God. Lord, guard my mind this morning. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. Father, Lord, I pray you give me the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, I go to your word, Father, for strength and guidance. This is how you prepare yourself. And you walk throughout your day, and let me tell you, here's the exciting part, is that God moments will begin to occur. This past week, last week, I got a message early in the morning, and I'm okay with that. I got a, I got a nice message on Facebook early in the morning. It was a good message. And someone here said, Pastor, I've been looking for those Jesus moments. And I had a Jesus moment with someone in my life. And I prayed, Lord, give me the words to speak. Lord, lead and guide me. And now there's an open door in that person's life. And I thought, man, that's what it's all about. Let me tell you, living for Jesus is not a boring thing. In fact, it's the greatest adventure you're ever going to go on. Trusting him is challenging. Because our natural response is, God, no, I just don't know. But when we surrender and trust him completely and say, Lord, I want, to be li- I want to live sober. I want to be ready. I want my life to be positioned that way. So that when you return, I'm ready to go. And I'm taking as many people with me. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. You know, we talk about things like the return of Christ. A lot of times fear can come in. You think, you know, you, you think about things that are happening and, and you're reevaluating life. But even in the scripture we just read, Paul reminds us that Jesus isn't coming to just bring damnation. But he actually came, died for us, so that we would have eternal life. But that one day he is returning. And when we live with that focus, Lord, if you come back in a year, if you come back in a week, if you come back in 50 years, I want to stand before you and say, I lived ready. I lived sober. I encouraged those around me that were in their walk and in their journey. I told as many people around me as I walked, in, I was, as, a, as our world was full of darkness, Lord. Lord, I wanted my life to be a light in the darkness to draw men to you. But I want to ask you today, if you're here today and you say, hey, pastor, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have that relationship. I know the stories. I've been in church. I can relate to you on that. That was my story for 17 years of my life. Or maybe you say, you know what? I I just, I'm really not living the way I need to. I've let other priorities into my life. I'm not living sober. I'm not living ready. I'm living distracted. I'm living full of a lot. I'm living for me. If that's you today, you say, Pastor, I I need this moment. I need this moment to say, Lord, forgive me, wash me, heal me, ready me. God, I want to be used mightily in this hour. I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to take a step of faith and raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Because when we do this, we say, i denying myself. Because listen, your will doesn't want you to do that. But let me tell you, this is critical. So I want to ask you again, if that's you, you say, Pastor, that's me. I want you to raise your hand. That's me, Pastor. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. Father, we thank you, Lord. And I just want to pray this, and I want you to pray this with me. 
I want us to agree in faith. I want us to agree upon, Lord, what do you want to do in our life? Because hopefully this isn't just a moment to raise your hand and say, okay, I did it. But that there's something that sticks, something that stays. So Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Lord, you, you rose from the dead. You came back for us. You did what you promised. And one day you're going to return. And Lord, you have a plan and a purpose for my life. You haven't forgotten me. You haven't abandoned me. And Lord, in this moment, I recognize that I'm not living sober. I'm not living ready. Lord, there's a lot of things that are happening in life, and I'm letting that get my focus. I'm letting a lot of things steal my peace. But Lord, in this hour, Lord, I, I surrender to you. I lay me down. I lay my will down. And I ask you, Lord, today, Father, would you do what only you can do? As I surrender to you, Father, would you wash me clean? Would you make me new, Father? Lord, I need you today more than ever before. And Lord, would you use me in the testimony of what you're doing in my life right now? Lord, may I be bold to tell others and have those Jesus moments in telling them about the hope of who you are. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven me. Lord, as I repent, Lord, I ask that you would wash me clean, that you would make me new, Father, that you would ready me again for this hour. I want to live ready in the final trimester, Lord. I want to live ready, Lord, in those final hours, Lord. I want to be ready, Father. I thank you, Lord. Lord, that it's not by my might or my power, but Lord, it's my reliance on you, on your presence, on your spirit. And I thank you, Lord, today, and I ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, 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 amen. Listen, I promise you, this is not just a, hey, we got to fill the next three weeks. This is, I feel, I feel the, th this is a critical message for us because it is vitally important and critical not only to our lives, but to those around us that we live sober and ready. And when we do that, we're going to see drastic things happen in our lives as we realign ourselves and we're going to see people around us catching the hope of Jesus Christ, getting free from things in their life. And that's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. Listen, next week, join me next week. We're going to lean into this a little bit further. And we're going to go back to this again. And there's another aspect of this that we're going to look at in another, another uh, chapter of this same, same book of the Bible. And so I want you to come ready next week. I want you to just focus, Lord, what do I need to do? I want you to come ready. Listen, tonight, if you want to become a member, join us at 5 o'clock here. Next Sunday, if you want to get baptized, I want you to come and talk with Dana right now and let her know we're going to be ready. And uh, why don't you stand with me, greet someone again, let them know, hey, let's live ready. Let's live ready. Let's live with some intention. Amen? We love you. God bless.